Passion Business Podcast, the podcast for free spirits with a big idea who want to turn their passion into a business. I'm Anke Herman and I'm your host. My guest today is the CEO and founder of Data Driven Marketing. They help online course creators increase their revenue by on average 4.86%. With 20 years of experience in building funnels and a degree in mathematics, he has conducted extensive data analysis of hundreds of millions of dollars of online business to create the field of strategic funnel optimization. Data-driven marketing has proven this process by helping dozens of online course creators multiply their revenue and directly drive several million of dollars sales a year. He's a guest lecturer at Greenwich Business School and he has been featured on Forbes. Welcome, John Ainsworth. Hello and welcome, John. I'm delighted to have you here today. I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks very much. So let's just dive straight in. Let people know where you're based, where you're from, and what's your business. Yeah, so I'm English. I'm based in London some of the time. That's where I am now. I spend normally about six or seven months a year here, and then the rest of the time, wherever seems like fun. You know, avoid the British winter. Uh, I did two months in Mexico, November, December, two months in Portugal, January, February, and I'll go to Croatia in a little bit. So, you know, but a lot of the time I'm here. Smart man. <laughs> 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 so what's, what's your business? What's the business that allows you to live like that? We work with people who have a big audience that could be authority site owners or YouTubers or um, people with a big podcast and help them to make a lot more money through courses. So if they've already got courses, we help them to sell more of it. And if they don't, we help them to get started with um, implement selling other people's courses, building their own courses, that kind of thing. And the, the thing it's possible there, as most people don't realize, is you can normally somewhere between like two and 10 times the amount of revenue that you're currently making by implementing this whole system. And so it makes people who've got an audience, makes the audience worth a lot more to them. So I run a team who does that. Um, we've got a done for you service where we do everything for people. We've got a coaching service where we help people to do it themselves. And the whole thing's remote. And I've got a team of seven people um, who who run mo basically all the day today. I just get to go and talk to people like you and have fun and share the story, you know. Way to go. <laughs> so now my guess would be that when you left school and thought, oh, what am I going to do with my life? That probably wasn't on the horizon. Probably didn't even exist. No, so it didn't exist. No. <laughs> where did you start out, and and you know what was your first dip into the professional world? Yeah, so my first job was, I mean, apart from you know whatever random paper round and working at McDonald's was um, a sales job. I went to America, went door to door selling books, uh, educational books, and so it was. It was commission only. You only got paid based on what you sold. And so it was a real go, you know, throw yourself straight in at the deep end and see if you can make this kind of stuff work. And so that really gave me the taste for, it wasn't working for yourself, but it was like, it was closer than a regular mm -hmm. job, you know? And um, so I did that for like three or four years and that gave me a chance to travel quite a lot and work out in the States. And that was quite fun. And everybody said to me, why, why don't you get a real job? And I was like, oh, these real jobs must be fantastic for everyone to rave about it so much. And it's not, it's not really all it's cracked up to be, it turns out. So I did that for a few years and was like, well, this is, this is no fun. Why am I doing this? I don't see the benefit. It's stifling. I have to be in this office at this certain time. I have to listen to this idiot boss, what have you. But the field that I got into was um, working with using digital marketing in order to get people into physical activity. So I'd, I'd worked up to being the campaigns manager for Sport England, which is the government organization for sport. And then I left there and I set up my own business doing that for charities and councils. And a part of the reason there was I wanted to be able to have freedom. I'd read the four hour work week. I was like, yes, let's go and make this happen. And I was like, what skills have I got? Let me go and take this and just do this remotely. And I did that for a number of years and it was, the problem with it was some parts of it fitted perfectly. It was like a, something where I got to make a difference in the world. I got to help most of people. I got to, you know, 
start to help this industry to actually take on digital marketing as a thing that would allow them to get much better results. And I got to work remotely. The downside to it is I was working with government and government is not, it's, you had to drag them kicking and screaming into the 21st century. You really did. And it was, it was a a lot of a slog. I think I built it up to maybe $300,000 a year in revenue. And it was like, I just was like, I can't get this to scale properly. These guys are a nightmare to work with. So I reached a point about four years ago where I decided that's it. I'm going to shut that business down. And I kind of was at a bit of a crossroads in my life trying to figure out, well, where do I go? Where do I go from here? Mm. So I'm, I'm always curious, like that that's, I mean, you definitely with the sales job, like went right in there, right? I think you probably mm. learned like the most crucial lessons that I, you know, that sense of, well, don't take no personally, <laughs> you know yeah. and that sense of like if you don't sell you don't eat kind of you know i think a lot of people when they first leave their jobs because i think most people that i speak to leave their jobs because they want more freedom they want more autonomy and when it hits that it comes with that sense of like that carpet of the monthly paycheck gets pulled away under you so i think yeah. you've already like you learned that really really soon so so what's your like i want to i want to hear i want to hear you say what it is you actually study uh mathematics so that's that's because that 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 is relevant for what we what what you're doing now so were you the typical sort of geek or were you the mathematician who is more interested in in how it applies in in all different kinds of other ways what the way i decided what to do was i was this might sound arrogant i was just really good at stuff at school and it's just like i just found it relatively easy but particularly maths i just found i could just do it without trying that hard it just made sense to me and i had no idea what i wanted to do with my life but i knew that everybody was impressed by the fact i was good at maths and I was like, okay, well, that probably will serve me well if I can, if I just can do something that other people find difficult and then they'll be impressed. By. And you know what? That has continued to be the case to this day. Like, I don't remember a lot of the stuff I did at university around like special relativity and um, quantum mechanics and all of this kind of stuff. I couldn't do that math anymore. But the fact that, that I got a first in maths from university still makes people go, oh, you must be smart. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I was like, all right, cool. That kind of worked out well to a certain extent. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. That, I mean, that does make sense. And it's, it's an interesting one, like the perception of it, right? It's like, I've really seen both sides of it because like I was, I was good at maths. I've always loved maths. It made sense to me. And I was good at languages. Right. But so I went for the languages and found like, oh, well, that's cool. But that's not worth paying money for. Right. right? Whereas like software where I'm thinking, oh, well, that's just another language simpler. Right. That all of a sudden was, oh, my God, this must be difficult. So that, you know, like being on the good end of the perception, like I totally, totally relate to that. So now I'm curious like how did you get your first client like you, you sort of just sort of throw that in there like oh i just work for government how the heck did you get them to hire you so i find it quite natural to be able to i guess maybe it's because i did sales door to door for so long but what i do is i i was doing this work for government you know i had a job there and i built up a network of people who who i would help a lot and so my job as campaigns manager, I did a lot of networking, connected with a lot of people. I would help people from other organizations with their campaigns as well. And I had uh, somebody from the Department of Health who I'd help out a lot. And she found out that I was, I just talked to her about like, well, what things do you need? What problems do you have? What's going on? And would offer to help her with it. And when she found out I was leaving, she's like, well, who's going to help me now? I said, well, I could, help, I could still help you more no it's just i'll have to charge you separately and she's like okay so it was like it was quite natural the thing that i always did that i always found easy was go and talk to people about their problems and people love to talk about their problems i love it someone will listen to their problems and then say do you want some help with that 
And then people often say yes. And if they say no, well, it's you really don't have to take that personally because it's not like you've not pitched them anything. You're just asking, do you want this? Do you want to help with that? And then a lot of times people say yes, and then you help them with it. And the, the benefit of that is you then have a contract and you've got money coming in. The downside to it is it can end up being that every project's different and you can't build so much a business out of it, more just kind of consultancy gigs, which is great, right? When you're getting started, but it's not like long-term. I knew that I wanted to build a, a, a business that wasn't just based around me. So that kind of took a bit more time, like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me more about that. I mean, did you know... Like, how did you know the direction you wanted that to take? So what was it that, that you think, well, in my perfect world, like this is the kind of business I'd want? So the way that I got into that field of working with people around physical activity was I read a book called What Color Is Your Parachute? And it's about how to find your perfect job. And it talks about how do you find, what's the things that you love to do? What's the things you're great at doing? Uh, ask a lot of questions to help you to answer that suggest you go and talk to lots of other people and, and try and use their answers to figure it out and combine that with what does the market want mm -hmm. and the problem i the thing that i got wrong there i believe is i started a lot from what was the things that i liked and i was good at and i wanted to do and not enough from what did the market want and so what that meant was i figured out like okay i figured my ideal dream job is grassroots sports marketing <laughs> and then i'm like great And I looked around and I was like, that doesn't exist. And one of the things about me is I'm so sure of myself and I'm so determined that I was like, well, that doesn't matter. I'll figure it out. I'll make that happen. And I think I would have made my life a lot easier if instead of that, I'd said, well, let, why don't I look for something that does exist? <laughs> <laughs> like, yep. it's, it's a wonderful thing to like, just be, you know, so certain of yourself. But it's like, I do look back and I think, You just made a lot of grief for yourself there. You really did, you know? <laughs> so what I did when I, um, eventually I shut that business down like four years ago, because I was like, this is just such a slog trying to like create this market at the same time as serving them. And, um, and uh, that's, yeah, that's when I kind of set up the current business. I just, I just love that you say that it's because it's a very much an artist thing, right? Mm. It's like, it's, it's literally the artist. The art, and I've, I've seen it in my sewing business. Like, you know, like when the artist will always go like, it's my, pa it's coming through me. Like, this is my passion. This is what I want to offer, but I don't want to have to take into account what you want. I just want you to pay for it kind of thing, you know, yeah. and that usually until you find that sweet spot, it won't really work. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so how did you go about setting up the current business? So what was the what was the plan? What were the steps to get to get to where you're now? Well, I shut down the previous one because I was like, I can't make this fit with the freedom that I want to have and running the kind of business that I want to have. It's just it didn't all line up properly together. And I was very It was, it was quite traumatic for me because I'd, I'd worked on it for so long with so much determination to, to let go of something like that was really, really hard. And so I was very unsure of myself at the time. And I was like, I'm going to go get a job. And I went and started applying for jobs. And I was like, is, is what I've done and my skills actually useful in the marketplace in, in online business? Because I thought I'll move. I, I knew a lot of people running online businesses. And I thought I'll go work with them because that then will allow me more freedom. And um, within like a couple of weeks of applying for jobs, I got a couple of offers for lots of money. And I was like, oh, okay, fine. My, my skills are useful in the marketplace. This is all good. And then I was like, do I actually want to go work for somebody really? And I was like, oh, I can't face it. So I, start, I was like, no, I'm going to start up a new business. <laughs> so that took about a month <laughs> before I was like, no, I can't. I, I'm not up to doing that. So um, what I did was I, I thought, let's try it differently this time. Let's start from what the market wants and see what is it there's demand for and then how that lines up for me. So I was looking at this Venn diagram of three things. What does the market want? What am I good at? And what do I like doing? And so I looked at a number of different industries. Like one of the things that I'd found in the previous business was that by building these funnels, we could fill up a gym or a kickboxing class or a yoga studio or something like that really, really quickly. And once they were full, they didn't need us anymore. And so they would stop paying. 
and and so it was like okay if i'm really good at this thing i can i i don't make more money from it i need to kind of draw it out a little bit <clears throat> so i thought why don't i go work with people who've got unlimited capacity and so if i can do this really well for them then it could work out brilliantly so i looked at uh e-commerce businesses and SaaS software as a service businesses and uh, online courses. And I started actually, the plan was to talk with SaaS businesses. So I interviewed 10 or 15 people who worked with them or ran SaaS businesses to kind of find out about their problems, what it was like working with them, what the industry was like. And then I listed out like, what's all the problems that they've told me about? What's all the things that people here need help with? I listened to lots of podcasts. I'd actually applied for some jobs with some SaaS businesses and kind of learned through that what were the things that they wanted. And then I listed, okay, well, which of those things can I help with? Which of those am I good at? And then out of those, which of those are the ones I actually like doing? So I came up with like four or five. And then I went into a bunch of different Facebook groups for SaaS businesses. And I surveyed in there and I said, which of these things is like the top problem that you would want help with? And then out of those, I got a couple of things. It's like, okay, I could do this or I could do that. And it was about using data in order to help them to be able to improve their marketing. And the one option I came up with was, what if I do a review of your marketing numbers for you every month and help you understand where you're at and what's going on and what you what is improving and what's working well. And another one was uh, helping them to actually build funnels. And so doing stuff around email marketing and sales pages and checkout pages and, and upsells and helping them to increase their revenue. And so I, I offered free audits for people to look at their business and go through their numbers and come up with a plan for them around, around their funnel. And I would spend, I think I spent like three, four, five days on each one. I did five or six of those. And then two of those people hired me for actually doing it for them. One of them for doing the monthly analysis of his numbers. And he's still, I still work with him today, four years later. And then the other one was for the building the funnels and the building the funnels paid way more per client. And so I decided that's the angle that we'd go down. So I've still got the original client from the, the numbers review, but, and I still do that every month and, and go through it. And he has six times his revenue in that time. Um, but, but I decided to kind of focus on the, the funnel side of it. That seemed to be an area that was lots of demand people really needed. Um, yeah, and then I that was so that was kind of how I got started with it. I mean, I I just love the evolution of it, and mm. thank you so much for sharing that thought process, right? Because that really shows that all oh, these are the options. It, it's going out talking to people, like it's all the bit that people often think, oh, I just kind of follow somebody's formula and then I can skip all that, right? Mm. So, but it is an evolution, and yeah, so. Well, I think the important thing there to understand for everybody is if you follow somebody else's formula, you're kind of living somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. And for each person, there's, they have specific things that they value that matter to them about the work that they do. And they have things that matter to them about the way that they are and how they see the world. And they have particular skills that other people don't have. And they're in an industry that might be different to somebody else's one. And I, I think these systems and formulas, what have you are great, but you have to just be cognizant of the fact that you might need to ad adapt large parts of it to really make it work for you. I tried it before I worked with a coach who had a system and I, tr he, he tried to get me to follow his system for my business and it totally didn't work because he didn't understand yeah actually the stuff that we do, what really matters to us is about achieving this level of excellence and helping people to make a lot more money. And what he was doing was more of a productized service where it was like you crank out this stuff with loads and loads of people. And the two of them clashed so badly that me trying to follow his system, I, I was fighting myself the whole time. I was trying to force myself to follow that when it didn't fit with my whole value system. So there's a lot of stuff to get right to make it work for you you know it has to fit for your goals it has to fit for your lifestyle your skills what you what you love about running the business it's got to fit for what you're good at what the market wants all of this stuff's got a line it's not terribly easy figuring this out you know yeah. well i mean that's that's the whole that's the thing it's like you know it's like somebody said the other well if it was easy everybody would do it would do it mm. right but at the same time 
it is incredibly rewarding and you can now <laughs> be you know in mexico portugal wherever you know croatia yeah. you can can kind of spend your life the way you want to so what would a client now typically come to you what would they say like what's going on for them and then what how how do you help them so the bulk of our clients have no idea how much more money they could be making they just don't they don't have awareness of the possibility so what will happen is i'll go on people generally hear about us from me talking on a podcast about like what's the you know if you're running a business you've got lots of traffic you've got courses and you're not making as much money as you'd like this is how much more money you could make and these are kind of the steps you need to have in place and then people hear that and they're like oh okay well let's let's talk about that so it's very much like a, a new potential is kind of realizing like a new revenue stream for them so it's that in some ways that's phenomenal because it means that we've basically got no competitors in that space mm -hmm. in other ways it's a pain because people aren't already looking for a solution to this thing so it kind of makes the marketing a little bit more interesting a little you know you have to do it in quite clever ways mm -hmm. um but when they come to us they're like okay well great i've got this audience so like, I've, we've got a, a client at the moment started with us back in i think december maybe and she had a big youtube audience and she had a course and she was making a, a few thousand a month from her from her course and we said to her well you should be making 50 60 100,000 a month from this she's like come on don't be ridiculous um she already had more money than she needed you know from ads and sponsorships what have you but she trusted us enough to say, okay, well, cool. I'll sign up and work with you guys. And she's now making her first, she wanted to get, to, I, I laughed at her. She wanted to get to 10,000 a month. Um, and I was like, well, that's not going to happen because we're just going to skip that, you know, <laughs> 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 like let's not even talk about that. And I was like, we'll probably hit 30,000 straight away. And I was wrong. She hit 50,000 in the first month. And then like, <laughs> 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 and then now she's doing like she's on track for like a million a year kind of thing so it's like people who've already got the big audience and got courses it's it's there's just this system that we've built and and developed and and learned from everywhere else and refined and improved that just works incredibly well and so what we're doing is we're helping them to implement get more of their visitors or their youtube audience or whatever to get onto their email list get more of the send out regular email promotions in a way that their email list likes. So it's useful content mixed with a uh, promotion. So more of those people buy, offer those people additional things. So they buy something. Okay. Well, what else might you like? You might want to get this and this and this so it increases the revenue per sale and then work on their sales pages, their checkout pages, that kind of thing as well. So that's kind of the, a very simple overview of the process, but it, it basically on average allows people to about five times their revenue from the, from their core sales. That's fascinating. Yeah, because I think there's so many moving pieces in there. And I think it's yeah. it's really difficult to see that for yourself, right? Sort of oh, where, yeah. so where do you find would be people's biggest kind of pot? Like, where's the biggest leak in that system for people? Because, you know, if somebody's built such a big audience, well, yeah. they would have thought something, right? So there's, she had a course, like, let's just take that example. So she had a course. So obviously she would have had something in place to get her YouTube audience to, to, to that course. So now where's the biggest, is there a pattern that you can yeah. see that sort of most people like miss out most in this part? Yeah. So it's about, it's about regular email promotions. So if you look at a lot of people who've got a lot of traffic, let's say someone's got a website with 50,000 visitors a month and they've got some way for people to get onto their email list. Normally the biggest amount of money that they make during the year they have these giant spikes in sales when they send an email promotion but people only send two to three email promotions a year they send it on black friday and then maybe july 4th and maybe new year or when they have a new course come out something like that and the reason they do that is because they don't want to be spammy and salesy and they don't want people to unsubscribe and that's the biggest that's the biggest gap now all of these things they multiply through 
it's not that you do one and it adds to the next one, adds to the next one. If you can double the size of your email list and you send twice as many email promotions, well, now you make four times as much sales. And if you then increase the revenue per sale to double, well, now you're doing eight times as much sales. So it's like they all multiply through each other. But that's the, that's the one that most people are missing. Just, it's just, yeah. It upsets me, <laughs> but it's, it's almost everybody like 95, 99% of people I talk with. It's two to three promotions a year. Yes. I, I mean, that totally is in line with my experience <laughs> because, yeah. because people will always like, okay, you need an email list. Yeah. But, but, but I thought I don't want to bother people. Right. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and I always have this, I always create this example, which is like, it makes me laugh every Saturday. Right. Because I'm on this person's email list and, Every Saturday, there's this like Sarah suggests, and I'm like Sarah, who? That's the thing. Like, I think there's more of a problem that the, the issue that people don't remember you is much bigger than that you bother people, yeah. right? So if they because if they don't want to be there, they can unsubscribe, right? You know, and and but the the worst thing you can do is or you know if you show up after six months, hey, I'm back. Do you want to buy my stuff? Well, that usually doesn't go down well, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, and one of the interesting things is a lot of people think that, well, if I send more regular promotions, then less people will buy per promotion. So it's it, it'll just work out the same anyway, which is just not true. Hmm. Um, we find that somewhere between 0.1 and 0.7% of people's email lists will buy with every promotion that they send. On average, it's about 03 If you do the absolute most monumentally fantastic, incredible launch you can maybe, if you're lucky, get 2% of your audience to buy in that one promotion. And but probably you won't. Probably, even if you do an amazing job, it's like 0.7%. Well, if you send out two, three promotions at 0.3% versus one incredible launch at 0.7%, you have already made more. And it's less work to do three small promotions than one giant launch. I mean, launches are a nightmare. If you're doing like webinars and Facebook lives and challenges and you're doing stuff, working with the audience all the time, they're so stressful. And then if it doesn't work, well, then you're really in trouble. Whereas if you do a couple of promotions a month and you, and you make them good quality, you can just do that all the time. No stress, all good, get ahead of it. No problem. You know, it's just yeah. a much you know you've still got to make sure the content's good and so that people want to get your emails and they like them and they're useful as well as being you know as well as having promotion in there otherwise they might unsubscribe but yeah it's it's very doable and I, I love the you know <laughs> i love the mechanical nature almost like the method not mechanical methodical right mm. and so it's like there's see that's what i'm thinking like there's the mathematician coming through yeah it's like okay yeah. here's the number it's kind of like there's no doubt about that it's really clear yeah. where to where to go with that so you would basically just start at one leak and improve that and then you improve the next and you and i think there will be probably constant improvements possible because like once you've changed in the back there then you could probably make adjustments at the front again right so yeah. there's really no yeah there's no three main end to that three main leaks people aren't getting enough people to get onto their email list from their audience they're not getting enough of the people on the email list to then buy and then their revenue per sale is too low so we actually start with the revenue per sale i said the biggest leak is email promotions because that's the thing overall that like drives all the revenue but there's a very specific reason we start with a revenue per sale because it's the quickest one to change so if someone's got a they're making sales already and then you add in an order bump which is where you have an additional item available on the checkout page it's like a tick box two sentences a description something else available for people to buy you can set that up in hours less less possibly you know like if you sit down think about it decide what you're going to include write the text put it on there rewrite it what have you then you're maybe talking like a half a day or something you know and it's like yeah there's there's more to doing it brilliantly but just to put something up is very very quick and so people put something up and then immediately that day or the next day they start making sales well then they go oh well now i trust the system a bit more yes. whereas if we did something that takes three months to get this amazing result it's after two months some people give up so we start with what's the quickest win and that's the order bump and then we go on to the upsell which is the confirmation page having something additional that people can buy and so people are now making 20 30 percent 40 percent maybe more revenue if they've got that right and then we work around to the email promotions and start sending some of those 
And then once we've got that working a bit, then we start increasing the number of opt-ins on the site as well. But we just do a basic version of all of that, like you say, and then we go back around the circle again and optimize it because you make the quickest increase by going from, you know, zero to one rather than from trying to get all the way up to 10. Getting to 10 out of 10 is really difficult, but just getting something in place is easy. And then you make it a bit better and then you make it a bit better and you keep going around. So we've got done for you clients we work with. We've got one that we've got them from 20,000 a month to 170,000 a month average. And we've been working with them for a bit over a year and we've, we've still got steps in there that we're going back around and optimizing and improving and what have you. It's like, there's loads and loads of work in it to make it amazing, but just to make it better, you can do quite quickly. Mm, I love that. And I love the, the iterative process because I, I ramble on about that all the time because that's how software is developed. Mm. Nobody goes like, oh, we have an idea for a platform that does this. Oh, let's just hammer out the whole thing. Like, no. You know, you start off with the core functionality and then you improve and you come around and you test and come around and you slowly create it and you build on, you know, and I think that what I'm hearing is that the process is exactly the same. Mm. And that makes a lot of sense to me, that's for sure. Yeah. And it's not so, the way that not everybody does it. Like some people will go in and be like, right, we're going to do this massive launch. It's going to be fantastic. And you put in three months, six months worth of work into it. And I just think that sounds exhausting. It just doesn't and a seem- high risk too, because it doesn't you quite know. work out the way you thought, you know, and we know there's so many assumptions in there yeah. that you can't control hundred percent. Yeah, totally. And it's, you mentioned before about like the mathematical approach with it. It's that's exactly what we've done. The business is called data driven marketing. And what we've done is go through and say, well, everybody's doing all these different marketing tactics, but nobody seems to have ever looked at it to say, how well does each one work compared to the others? in terms of how much money it makes, how does it work in terms of how much time does it take to do it? And do, how willing are people to do it? So for example, webinars work fantastically well and people who have automated webinar funnels can make huge amounts of money from it and it's, and it's brilliant. But the course creators we work with hate recording webinars and so they never get around to doing it. And it's really a lot of work to make a very good webinar funnel, like a lot of work. But to set up an order bump is dead easy. Mm. So it's like, okay, well, since the dead easy thing can make you 10 or 20% more revenue and the amazing webinar funnel is like, well, it could be life-changing, but it's going to take like three, six months. Let's start with the order bump. You know, and so we went through and we analyzed every single tactic. I have no idea how many it was, but, you know, dozens and dozens of tactics. And we tried them all out and we looked at data from other people's funnels and collected them. And nobody knew their numbers at all. Nobody had any idea. They're just like, oh, yeah, we're doing well and we're doing these things. And uh, so we collected all of that and then did the analysis of it. And that's how we got to the current system. I love that. So so where where do you see your business in, in let's say in a year's time where you're headed what's the aspiration yeah so at the moment we've got done for you clients and coaching clients and we're using the money that we make from that to build up a war chest and then we're going to start buying these businesses ourselves so we're going to buy people who've we're going to buy like sites that have got a lot of traffic let's say it's in a a lot of our clients are in like small niches it could be like dog training or home recording studios or gardening or bass fishing or what have you, right? So it's all of these things. And they've got a team of people who create all the content and do all the link building, what have you. So we'll buy those businesses and then start to actually implement our system on that ourselves. And then we get to keep, instead of making our clients so much more money and we just charge a fee every month, we'll get to keep all of the revenue from that. And so we'll start relatively small build it up, either sell it on or just keep it for cash flow, and then do it again and then do it again and do it again and kind of build up the whole team with that. Because one of the things that's, I love our clients and they're fantastic. But one of the things I find is that everybody's got all these blockages. Everyone's got all these things that hold them back. And so even though we know what they need to do, they don't always do it. And so that makes life harder. And I've spent my whole life learning to deal with my own emotions and myself and manage, you know, learn how do I, how do I, not get in my own way and not have all these blockages and not everyone's willing to do all of that kind of work and so having to also work 
that through with clients as well. It's like another thing that's that kind of slows the process down. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to create effortless flow in the business. We're trying to make the whole thing just work beautifully smoothly. And I think if we just own the business, own the sites ourselves, that's going to make the whole thing just flow way better. So I kind of see us growing out to, we're currently doing like, like three quarters of a million a year, something like that. And I see it growing in a few years out to like a million a month, something in that kind of ballpark over the next two, three years. I, I worry sometimes that I mean, even then I'm thinking too small, um, that the opportunity is bigger than that. But that's kind of what I'm, that's where I'm comfortable with seeing for the moment. And then once we get closer, I can kind of start to see further. That's, I love that because that's the thing. It's like when you get through another couple of rounds of the iterations, you'll be able to see the next bit that's coming. Yeah. That's fascinating. I love, I love that. I love the way you think. Like it's just, so where can people go and find out more about you and get in touch with you yeah if if anybody listening has got um a big audience and they want to know about how this could work i mean they don't have to even have a big audience to, to find it out but that's kind of the people we work with they can go to um uh, pimpyourfunnel.com and <laughs> such a cool name <laughs> 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 there's a there's a form there people fill it in there's like 10 or 12 questions and uh we will figure out for them how much more revenue they could be making like specifically for their business we will the team will go through it. it'll take a couple of days some to go through and analyze it and calculate the results we've got this nine point strategic um, optimization funnel and then they'll send them through a personalized plan after that it's totally free um yeah it's just at, at pimpyourfunnel.com Awesome. Well, thank you so much. There's an incredible amount of gold in here. So I'm very grateful that you shared all of that. Thank you. And I can't wait to talk to you again. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and leave a review to help others find it. If you are a coach, speaker or author, a passionate big picture thinker with a vision and you want to build an online business to reach and impact more people, Go to passionbusinesspodcast.com and download a free copy of my book, Taming the Tech Monster. And join my free community, Don't Just Learn, Create, Business Building for Mavericks to connect with others on the same path. That's passionbusinesspodcast.com. I'll speak to you soon.